test, test, test. Test, test, test.
comes out, can you hear it? Yep. All right. So you are good to go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Morris. Today, I'll be focusing on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on rural public health. Since the summer of my sophomore year of high school, I have been an active participant in the Santera Martha Jefferson Junior Volunteer Program. Within this program, there is a strong trust in the importance of public health and its impact on communities in light of the ongoing pandemic. While the urban community of Charlottesville was a main focus during my time as a volunteer, Still, I wonder how the principles we were learning could be applied to more rural communities, such as the one that I call home. To answer this question, I chose to research the trends that have surfaced in rural communities as a result of the pandemic and have shown to require the most attention from public health experts across the country. These include a decrease in healthcare access, an increase in health-related disparities, and the negative effect on teen mental health. After reading articles and analyzing informational maps, such as the one presented next to me, I was able to identify the threats causing these discrepancies. These include geographical isolation and low socioeconomic status and have exaggerated the fault lines in our modern society. To better understand how these threats impacted my own community, I completed my professional learning experience at the Health and Wellness Medical Services Clinic in Madison, Virginia under my mentor, Fanny Ouse. I chatted under Mrs. Ouse for four days in which I completed five hours each day. Through this experience, she taught me the importance of public health, especially in small and more rural communities like Madison. In line with the ongoing pandemic, she guided me in discovering the overall impact of COVID-19 on rural public health through numerous hands-on experiences, including direct patient contact and analysis of, the, analysis of the health trends present at her own clinic. Pictured here is my mentor, Mrs. Fanny Oost. Being born and raised in Madison, each day she expressed to me how much she wanted to give back to a community that gave so much to her. With her high level of experience and charming personality, she was able to do just that. Fanny Oost graduated from James Madison University with, with her Master's of Science in Nursing and is a current registered nurse and board certified nurse practitioner. Before bringing health and wellness medical services to Madison, she worked as a registered nurse for UVA Hospital where she was able to establish her specialties in family practice, hospice, and palliative care. Through her clinic, she has been able to provide numerous public health safety resources to improve the overall health of her community. These include health safety screeners and COVID-19 informational packets. As a mentor, she allowed me to understand and witness firsthand how simple implications can lead to great long-lasting effects. Each day of the clinic, I spent a portion of my time at the front desk pictured next to me where I checked in patients. This involved changing their status to checked in and retrieving their chart to be handed to the nurse. I also screened each patient for common COVID-19 symptoms in which I took their temperature with a touchless forehead thermometer and asked them a series of questions regarding their most recent contact. Fulfilling this role at the clinic allowed me to connect with patients one-on-one -on -one and identify the most common reasons a patient would visit, which mostly included diabetes, infections, and routine health maintenance. Within the clinic, there is a simple lab where nurses and physicians can perform blood draws and run analysis on them before sending them off to a more enhanced lab for further testing. Each time a physician would perform a blood draw, blood draw they would take a caddy with them that included vials, tape, gloves, a tourniquet, and sterilized needles. At, through observing numerous blood draws and analysis, I was able to identify that the most common were a complete blood count, a metabolic panel, and a lipid panel. Within the clinic, there are four patient exam rooms, all with setups similar to the one pictured next to me. Each room includes a medical exam chair overlaid with medical exam table paper, a swivel stool for easy movement of the physician, informational graphics, and a cabinet full of proper medical supplies. 
Each time a patient would ex exit an exam room, I would go in and sterilize all equipment that was touched by or came into contact with that patient. For my community service project, I implemented my Mindful Mountaineers program into Madison County High School with the goal of promoting the mental health and well-being of its students and educating them on the ongoing health trends and demographic changes, changes that impact their mental health. To do this, I set up a bulletin board within a popular location in the school during the month of October. Each week, I changed the board to focus on a new topic regarding youth mental health. I presented these topics in ways that were both informative and interactive, making them more engaging for the students and successful in reaching my overall goal. I had four mentors from whom I sought guidance from during the planning and implementation of my community service project. Pictured on the left is Ms. Diana Webb. Diana Webb is a current community health educator for Sahara Martha Jefferson Hospital. She graduated from James Madison University with a degree in public health education and is the director of the Sahara Martha Jefferson Junior Volunteer Program. Pictured on the right are the Madison County High School school counselors, Ms. Smith, Ms. Tracy, and Ms. Miller. They all hold great expertise in advocating for the mental health of students within schools and developing strategies to aid students in need. This board was from the first week of my program. It was titled A New Mindset and focused on introducing students to the idea of mental health. It included definitions and examples of mental health literacy, as well as the differences between a mental health illness, disorder, and problem. Using this knowledge, students were then able to complete their own mental health check-in on the provided interactive, which included resources for immediate aid. After the week was up, I provided counseling a summary of the interactive to provide some insight on the overall mental health of the students within the school. The second week in my program focused on the importance of being vocal and learning how to successfully self-talk and express concerns. To help students feel more comfortable in voicing their concerns to the correct sources, I included stories of celebrities who dealt with mental health issues and spoke on how they sought aid. To aid in their own self-talk, I provided students with calming mantras to help them deal with any negative emotions they were experiencing. The third week in my program focused on the importance of word choice when speaking on different topics. The phrases next to me are matched in a way that at first present a more negative tone and then provide students with ways to change their thinking and speak in more hope-filled, confident sentences. The final week of my program focused on providing students with tools to thrive. Pictured on the bulletin board was a toolbox surrounded by different tools that students could use to aid to cope in different situations. In the blue folder on the left, I provided students with coloring sheets to help them escape any stress they were experiencing. In fact, these coloring sheets were so successful as an aiding tool that the folder was completely empty by the end of the week. In addition to my bulletin board, I hosted a school-wide National Uni Day on October 20th in which students wore orange to stand up against bullying within our schools and unite under kindness, acceptance, and inclusion. To make the concept more present within the school as well as to advertise the day, posters were hung up and Uni Day bracelets, ribbons, and information cards were passed out to every student. Through advocating and promoting rural public health through my professional learning experience and community service projects, I was able to introduce the principles and concepts necessary for society to determine the beginning of broader incorporated research on COVID-19 that integrates rural areas moving beyond the focus on urbanized cities. I was also able to provide my students access to resources and experiences that they can use to build social skills, self-awareness, leadership, and caring connections with mentors and adults within their communities that they can trust. Looking back on the entirety of my senior capstone project, I was able to uncover my true passion for public health and giving back to others. The most memorable moment from my experience was from my first day at the clinic when a patient came in for a blood draw. She was very nervous and asked if I could stay in the room with her to distract her from the, her procedure. We talked about my senior project, where her children went to school, and even what she was going to eat for lunch that day. Not only was I able to relieve her nerves, but she provided me with affirmation regarding my role in the clinic. I was able to form such a connection with a stranger in an unfamiliar setting, proving to me just how natural those situations felt, where I was using my own abilities to help others, which I hope to do for the rest of my life. Regarding future BUBGS students, I would advise them to start planning their community service projects and professional learning experience as early as possible. 
They must have the mindset that the people who hold these opportunities aren't going to come to them. They must communicate early and effectively in order to ensure a smooth project process. Personally, I started planning my professional learning experience the summer before my senior year of high school and was even able to complete it before the school year started. Therefore, setting me up for a semester in which I was ahead on the workload. Although I have not heard back from all of my prospective schools just yet, my current top choices are the University of Virginia and Virginia Tech. However, no matter the school I attend, I hope to, I plan on majoring in, major in biomedical engineering with a minor in public health, hoping to establish fundamental principles to empower the health of each individual. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, during my time at the clinic, Fanny Oots, she provided me with data she collected from her own clinic, and then using the information I was able to obtain from my Centera Martha Jefferson volunteer program, I was able to compare the two, which I used in my research paper. No, ma'am. I mean, you can you can do my whole. Work. So next up, we have Nate Herman, and his topic was um, child psychology in the classroom. Good morning, everybody. Ooh, wrong button. So a little bit about me. I came from a big family in Madison. Um, in my free time outside of school. I like to swim, play soccer, run cross country, hang out with friends, really anything um, that has to do with the uh, outside. Growing up, my parents taught me the value of education and why it's important, um, not just the, the academic side of it, but like socially, mentally, emotionally, and the opportunities that it creates for you. Which brings me to my research question, um, how child psychology affects the classroom. I thought it'd be super interesting to research all the variables that go into how children learn, not just the curriculum that they learn, but how their brains work and how they process information. My research was very hefty because I had to learn about the brain, which is basically a supercomputer. It um, pretty much controls your whole body, which is a lot um, pictured here. These are just some of the parts. Um, of the brain, they're called lobes, but I would like to focus on the frontal lobe and temporal lobe. Um, in my opinion, these are the lobes that really have a major part in developing early age as they develop with problem solving and language comprehension and memory, which are all very important in development. A major conclusion I drew from my research is that a child's upbringing has a great effect on the child's education. For, um, a child's brain is taking in everything that it can from 
books, movies, TV, people that they talk to. So all of these experiences are working in the brain to create information and to create how they act. So early in a child's life, they have two main um, guidances, which are the parents and the teachers. So those two groups create most of their experiences. So the teachers have a major role in how the child learns. For my professional learning experience, I was lucky enough to do it at Madison Primary School. It was really cool to do it there because I'm an alumni there. So it was really fun to go back and to see how it's changed. Um, it has changed a lot because they did renovations and I got lost on the first day. So that was fun. I did my professional learning experience under my mentor, Ms. Jarrett Caldwell. She is an outstanding first grade teacher who had a wealth of knowledge for me. She taught me how to lesson plan, how to engage with the kids, how to be creative, and how to deal with the less behaved kids. This is a picture of Ms. Caldwell's classroom. Something interesting that in this back corner, right there, there is something called the calm corner. So if a a child is having a bad day or something, or they say something like mean to another student, they go back there, and on the wall is four different pieces of paper that show how they're feeling. So say I was angry, I'd sit back there and take an angry sign and put it to, on a scale of one to five on how I was feeling, and that would, it helps the kids visualize how they're feeling, so they get a better grasp on their emotions, and they give like a solution, so if I was angry, say I'd do deep breathing for five minutes, and then I would, after that, I'd talk to Ms. Caldwell, apologize, and go back into learning. This was really cool, and because instead of just punishing the kid outright, she would give him a chance to think about it and reflect, and think about why they did what they did. That is the picture of the primary school, and that's another one. For my community service, I teamed up with my classmate Jewel Crop, and we decided to host a kickball tournament where all the proceeds would go to Madison Athletics to buy new recovery equipment. We, we decided to divide the teams into grades, each grade having their own spirit um, theme, and in between games they would have little spirit contests where the judges would give them points, and we would have a kickball winner and a spirit winner. Unfortunately, we did not have enough to field four teams, so our backup plan is after spring break, host a teacher versus student kickball game instead. And that is, that is the flyer that we put up around the school and handed out, and that is the sign-up sheet. This project was really, really fun for me. The, the research seemed daunting, but I actually really enjoyed doing the research, and it was also really cool to see, instead of just being like, oh, why is this kid so smart? Oh, he's gifted. Why is this kid not doing as well? He's behind the curve. Instead of just like chalking it up to that, I got to look deeper into why. Um, and that helped really put a perspective on education and why it needs to be advanced so the gifted kid doesn't get accelerated and the behind the curve kid just gets left behind. So it kind of levels the playing field for all parties involved. My advice for the class of 2023 not only applies to the class of 2023, but students around the world, find something you like doing and, and run with it. It creates many opportunities. Even if you don't like it in the end, that's, that's fine. You know you don't like it. Find something else, and it'll create more opportunities. Fall of 2022, I'll be attending Bridgewater College. I will be studying history there, as well as um, joining the swim team. Hopefully with this degree, I'll go on to middle to high school education and see where that takes me from there. As I'm wrapping up my presentation, I'd like to leave you with this quote by Kanye West. I was never good at anything except the ability to learn. Thank you, are there any questions? I did that. Well, Ms. Caldwell gave me some tips to help with the bad students and the, or not bad, 
less behave. And the, the calm corner was actually really cool because it had like nice chairs back there. And it was, it was really nice for the kids not to just be like, oh, sit out at recess. Instead, they got to think through everything. An hour or two every day for a while. It got spread out because she wasn't there sometimes and I couldn't make it. So around 10 hours, I was, I was in there with her. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. There is a few um, studies from the Wing Institute and Pew Research Center, but I don't remember them off the top of my head. Thank you.
Good morning, my name is Samantha Woodward and this is my senior capstone project, The Value of Cadavers. I chose the topic, The Value of Cadavers, for my senior capstone project because of what I wanted to do based off of my future career, and that is to be a medical examiner. The research question that I chose to answer throughout this project is, what is the most critical health and medical knowledge that can be gained from the dissection of cadavers? And I ultimately decided on that research question based off of what I personally wanted to learn and what I wanted to get out of this internship and community service. This is me in front of my internship, which was at the Surgical Skills Training Center and Anatomy Lab at UVA. And a little disclaimer for all of you, because of the nature of my topic, there are certain gory images. So if that's not something you're into, I don't suggest looking too closely into my slides. <laughs> like this one. <laughs> Answering my research question, which again is what is the most critical health and medical knowledge that can be gained from the dissection of cadavers, I really want to focus on answering that question, what do cadavers do for people that are still living? And that is, cadavers are a way for scientists and doctors to know more about the human body and doing stuff on the human body than, and you can do it on someone that you don't have to take their life in your hands. So that I think that would be my overall answer to my research question based off of what I learned from my internship. These are legs from a cadaver from my internship and this is a brain and those are my hands. So for size reference that's about an adult human brain for you right there. <laughs> Into my internship. I did my internship at the Surgical Skills Training Center and Anatomy Lab at UVA. And I went for three days. The first day that I went, it was for an open cervical procedure. And basically what that lab was, it was sales representatives. It was sales representatives testing equipment that was a new disc that would be inserted in someone's spine after a spinal injury. And it was, uh, they would then take what they learned from that lab at the cadaver lab and then go on to hospitals and try to sell the disc there to the hospital to use in spinal injury patients. The second time that I went, it was for a hip fracture lab, and that was sales representatives, but there was also actual surgeons and uh, medical school students there. And what that lab was, it was kind of an introduction to drills and new drill kits that the hospital already uses, but that um, the sales representatives had with them. So there was also VR being used in that and they were um, doing an actual hip fracture uh, surgery in the VR. The third time that I went, it was for an ENT program and that was hosted by Dr. David Moyer. He is an anatomy teacher at UVA and the anatomy teacher at the um, Surgical Skills Training Center Anatomy Lab. And uh, basically what that lab was, it was no sales representatives, but it was actual surgeons and medical school students. And basically it was just kind of an introduction into the ENT uh, world of a human body, and that is ear, nose, and throat for those of you who don't know. And it was just kind of an introduction to that. And this picture is actually a larynx from that lab. And again, for size reference, uh, that is my hand holding it, so it's about, your larynx is about that big. <laughs> um, and this is the lab. They have all the equipment in there, beds for the cadavers. My internship mentor was Ms. Dana Sikon, and she is the manager at the UVA Surgical Skills Training Center and Anatomy Lab. Ms. Sikon was a great uh, mentor to have because she is the manager. She knows how the lab works. She knows everybody that was in the three labs that I went to, so she was introducing me to all of them. She knows all of the procedures that go on, so she was taking me through them, answering any questions that I had, and she also just knows how the lab runs. So she was giving me a tour, telling me all sorts of things about the lab and about UVA. My community service. I conducted my community service here at MCHS in Ms. Kemp's room, which is, she's the nursing teacher. And what it was, it was a CPR training session. And 
was I had about eight participants, about four or five stayed for both days. It was a two-day event, and all the participants were my peers going to MCHS. And um, basically, what was taught in the CPR training session was adult CPR, infant CPR, adult and infant choking, and then the use of an AED. And I was teaching the class as I am CPR certified while Miss Kemp was overseeing me teach the class. And it was taught actually by a video and then the participants had a book that they could reference to at any time. This is four of the participants. That's Zoe, Dallas, Delaney, and Irwin. My community service mentor was Miss Kemp. She is the nursing teacher here at MCHS. She also teaches health and medical sciences. I have been in both of Miss Kemp's classes with her, and she was a great mentor to have just of her knowledge of, she's also a registered nurse, so her knowledge of CPR is so great. She's had to do it a lot with her um, job of being a nurse. And uh, Ms. Kemp was a great mentor to have her overseeing me do the CPR training session. The significance of both my internship and community service. Honestly, I think that the one significance that relates to both my internship and community service would be that they better the lives of the living. That is with cadavers, they are able to test they are able to test and kind of make sure that we know everything we can about the human body. They're able to test new devices and everything that you would want to do to a human body while not worrying about someone's life. And as for my community service, CPR is a great life-saving tool as well as knowing how to save someone that's choking and knowing how to use an AED. So all of those things put together would be a great life-saving skill to have. And I'm sure that all the participants left the CPR training session knowing a little bit more about how to save someone's life than they did when they entered. This was from the lab. This is uh, where the ENT part portion of it was um, centered around the neck. And then that's them closing the cadaver up. As for my community service picture over here, this is Nate and Jewel, two participants, and they are working together on an AED. A little reflection that I had throughout uh, this project was it really opened my eyes to the medical field, more than I already had been open to, and it really kind of solidified my love for the medical field and helping people. And with that, I have chosen my future career, and I am set on becoming a medical examiner. This is on a cadaver. That's actually, if you can tell, that's a stitch. And I did that, so that's fun. And then this is me with the book that was given to all the participants at the CPR training session. Having another go around, I honestly think that uh, I would I would have started a little sooner in trying to get an internship and community service, but overall I think that my internship and community service went very well um, with the time that I was given with it. And honestly, another go around, I, I think I would do most of the things the same, same way, honestly. Advice to the youngsters. If I could give any advice to the younger generation of Governor School, I would say relish your time that you have in your project because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity that high school students get and you you know not always getting that opportunity being in governor school you get that so uh, my advice to the younger generation would be honestly just savor your internship and community service because it's again it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and it's fun you know you get to go to UVA as a high school student you get to do community service help your community help the people around you and it's honestly just a great way to get familiar with um, what you want to do in the future this is some VR equipment that was being used during the hip fracture lab and that is Zoe giving breaths to her mannequin at the CPR training session my future plans. So I do have sort of a set plan of action for my future. And first of all, of course, that is graduating high school. 
And after graduating high school, I plan to go to a four-year university. I am between two right now, James Madison University and the University of Mary Washington. And after going to college, I plan on going to medical school. After medical school, I plan on going into the Navy for the medical program they have to offer. And after being trained medically by the Navy, I plan on going into the FBI to be the first medical examiner of the FBI. And finally, again, my name is Samantha Woodward. I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation. And now I open the floor to any questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, there was a part that my family played. Um, I, <laughs> funny story, actually. I definitely um, didn't know I wanted to be a medical examiner until kind of this year, I would say. Uh, I was first interested in the medical field. Um, my aunt, she was a nurse, and um, she's a great nurse. And um, she kind of got me interested in the medical field um, because, of course, you know, she worked there. And um, after that, I kind of, uh, researched a lot about the medical field and what it has to offer and how it can help people and I knew that I wanted to help people so it that was kind of where I ended up yeah yes ma'am yes ma'am me too yes I <laughs> mm -hmm. I did I did. I, it was great. It was absolutely phenomenal. It was such a surreal experience, I think. It was during COVID, of course, so it, it was a little harder to get in touch with people and um, kind of see what I could do being an outsider as I was. So um, it, it was a little harder, you know, a little, <laughs> a little lax on emailing and things. But um, in the end, you know, it was, uh, it was really great and it was such a surreal experience. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my god. Oh. This isn't on anymore. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs>
figure it out. Oh. Oh. Good morning. My name is Leah, and as Ms. Johnson said, my um, topic is COVID and how it affected local doctor offices. So my name is Leah. I'm a senior, and so I've been in medical since I was young because my mom, I grew up in doctor's offices. She worked at an OBGYN, and then she transferred to Wellspring, and so I've grown up going with her whenever she couldn't find a babysitter. So my topic was nursing and how it um, has been affected by COVID. I looked into um, money issues, lack of supplies, and then as well as um, why people aren't into nursing so much now. Uh, so I looked through several different research articles. Um, it was very evident that money was the main issue why people weren't wanting to go in healthcare anymore because they aren't getting paid as much. Um, and supplies due to COVID, Hospitals and main local doctor's offices were buying as much supplies as they could and not leaving any for the small doctor's offices, such as Wellspring. So for my internship, I did it at Wellspring. It is a um, office in Culpeper. They have a specialty clinic and then they also have a walk-in clinic. I did mine at the walk-in clinic. So my first mentor was Lisa Swall. She's not, pic I took, couldn't get a picture with her, but she works with the older um, population. And after two or three days of doing that, I realized it wasn't what I wanted to focus on. I wanted to move to pediatrics. So I moved to do it with Irene Brown, who is in the middle. Um, she works with the pediatrics. She works with Dr. Stein and Dr. Harnum. They are the pediatric nurses at Wellspring, uh, or doctors, sorry. And through that, I learned a lot with her. Um, I went, I did about close to 60 hours at Wellspring. I worked um, calling patients back, doing their weight, their height, doing their eyesight. Um, I would get all of their vitals, such as blood pressure, um, pulse, temperature. I would do their hearing exams, their eye exams, um, and any, if they needed physicals, we would do the eye chart, see uh, if they had 20, 20, 20, 40, whichever vision they had. Um, I couldn't give any shots or anything, so I'd watch as she would administer all of them. But um, due to doing the internship there, I do now work there. So now as I am working there, I'm getting to do all of these. Um, I can now do urine dips. I can working to do um, mono testing, which you just poke the finger and get blood for it. So for my community service, my first option was to do the free clinic here at Wells or here in Madison. I reached out to her multiple times. We were able to set something up, but it just wasn't working on both schedules. So ultimately, I changed it and I went ahead and went back with Wellspring. Um, I reached back out and they were able to set me up and help me come up with an option. There were two options. Um, we could either do a booth at Trick or Trunk and just hang, out, um, hang pass out packages or I could do them um, just in the office. And again, my mentor was Irene. Um, she helped us come up with ideas and I also did it with fellow BRVGS member Courtney who's not here currently. Um, so the packages included tissues, mask, toothbrush, toothpaste, hand sanitizer, um, cookies, other little small snacks, and candy. And as people would come in with their, um, after appointments, each nurse would grab a package and hand it to them. Um, it was, we'd made about a hundred or so and we did through a GoFundMe. I created one. We left it up for about two weeks with, and we got a total of $350 and ended up with 335 that we could use to purchase everything. The total was a little over budget, so it was about 350, so we paid about 15 to 20 out of pocket for the supplies. So for my reflection, this really helped me. Um, I've already had my CNA and I'm working to get my EKG and patient care technician, so that helps. I currently work in healthcare. I work with Wellspring every weekend, and then I also work at a local um, assisted living facility here in Madison. Um, so it really helped me to see why people aren't wanting to do it and why there is such a big need for no nurses and why healthcare needs a change. My advice for class of 2023, definitely reach out sooner rather than later for your internship and community service. You will hit a lot of bumps of the road and definitely have a backup plan in case it falls through. 
So for my future plans, I will be attending Longwood for four years and I will be doing their nursing program starting in the fall of 2022. And following that, I'm going to work in the PICU for the pediatrics. Thank you, are there any questions? Um, definitely need to have changes within facilities like communication, pay wise. A lot of people don't get paid as much as they should for healthcare, and especially with minimum wage about to go up, it's they, what they get paid is really close to minimum wage. So definitely look into increasing their pay to compensate for what they do, especially because a lot of them work for holidays, and when they're sh short staffed, everybody has to pull in to help. So definitely changing the pay. I'm not gonna lie about it. <laughs> Of like research field, like mine is more example based, so I just don't want to talk about my pictures the whole time, and I don't want to forget anything. So I think I look fine though. Yeah. Oh, I guess I can stand over here.
Awesome. Good morning. Like Ms. Johnson just previously said, I'm Zoe Polly, and my topic is how an animal, how your owner can influence an animal's behavior. So I started thinking about my presentation when Ms. Johnson previously told me that it was based on something that I enjoyed. And ever since as a small child, I've absolutely loved animals. Um, I've always loved being around them, dealing with them, anything that involved them. I've wanted to be a vet or to study veterinary science since actually the fifth grade, which seems like a long time ago, or it's like, oh, you're older. But it's, it's very soon for an individual to be like, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to be that. So I put this quote on here because it kind of simplifies how animals and individuals build throughout the the world, how they have interactions, and how it led into my presentation. Like I just said, when developing my topic, I used a very career-based motive towards what I wanted to do. I've always loved animals, and when developing, when developing this topic, I originally started with how genetics influenced an animal and not necessarily the owner. But moving through, I decided that being that animals are so individual based and you can have different types of genetics that lead to different animals and how different animals, even though they're related, can or cannot have the same genetics. So it was just a very complex topic. So I tried to narrow it down a little bit while keeping it still the same broad and in the same type of area and chose animal behavior and how the owner themselves can reflect upon the, the pet. So my research my research was a little less complex than others. So animal behavior is very individualized and personable depending on the animal themselves. So when, you're re when you do research for this, it's very difficult to understand the psychology and the different behaviors that go into animals because so many factors play into that. So my research more was, it was a broader type thing. I, research the different environments, the type of owners, different behaviors, and how they all reflected on those different outcomes. And that led me to developing my phase two, which was my internship and my community service. I interned with a dog trainer in Reva, Virginia. That was my internship. I audited her classes and was able to take notes and see how the different behaviors between the animals and the owners could change, whether in a group setting, in an individual type setting, and different things like that. For my community service, I used that same information to hold an info session at Hoover Ridge. It was an outside, it was completely dog friendly, and it allowed me to share my information that I learned with different owners of the community who had dogs. So Mahogany Ridge was the facility that I had my internship at. It holds different daycares, they have overnight stays, they do agility training, and then of course your classic obedience classes. Um, this facility, it was, it's a smaller barn in Riva. It's between Madison and Culpeper. It's very close to my house. And this is an owned and operated by Miss Teresa Richmond. She was my mentor throughout the entire thing. She was also a guest speaker at my community service. She is a very sweet woman and she has been a renowned trainer for over 20 years. She started in Upper New York where she was teaching different agility classes to dogs of all different kinds. She holds clinics on the weekends. She teaches her obedience classes, which I was able to participate in. And then she does overnight stays. She does grooming and all types of things like that. During my, <laughs> these, are, these images are of Miss Teresa with two different dogs. They were of the same night, I do believe, but you can tell how no matter the type of dog, and these were class, they were group sessions, the classes were. So these are her with two different dogs and the same class, because during those obedience classes, you have to train not only independently, but in a group setting. So they're all there together because your animal's behavior is going to be much different in a group setting than in a individual setting. So she's moving from one individual to the other to try to help with the training and their obedience and it depends on how they intake that information. My internship itself, I've talked a little bit about it so far, but upon 
coming into the internship, I was given a set of lesson plans. It's a five to six week course. And through these lesson plans, there's different examples of obedience training, different commands. And Miss Teresa herself used these. This is called the motivational method. It's written and published by Miss Volhard. I also got to meet her while I was there at the internship. She was participating in the classes. But I used these to be able to teach myself and to conduct that research throughout my internship as well. But some of those commands are pictured in these images here. This is a, a come command. It's where an individual stands on one side of the room with the dog and the owner stands on the other one. When the owner ha does not have proper attention of their pet, they'll say their name and here or whatever their come command is, the individual holding the dog will release the leash, they'll run across the room and then you treat the animal because it has attention for you as an owner now and it has released that distraction from one side of the room and come to you without any other sort of sidelines or go to see the other dogs because it is a class session so there's multiple different partnerships throughout the room. This other one is, it's called a bucket stand. <laughs> so you give them a pail to stand on, you hold the leash up, the dog stands on the bucket and you maintain attention with the animal with food, proper commands, and it, it sort of, it builds that relationship between the pet and the owner and ultimately betters their obedience. These are more images. This is Miss Volhard herself and her puppy Cricket. Cricket is only a few months old, believe it or not. She's a small dog, but she is only a few months and much, much more well behaved than some of the other dogs that were there. But that just goes to show the different behaviors that come from owner structure. And it's the perfect example because on this other side is a larger breed puppy. He was around the same age group and he was not necessarily bad behaved, but he did not have as much obedience and structure as Miss Crick, Miss Bard's Cricket did. He was raised with a bunch of kids, so it's hard to balance that out when your kids are, I wanna play with the puppy, and the mom's like, he still needs to sit. <laughs> so, there goes to show how your owner affects your animal's behavior. For my community service, I used all this research and this information that I received from my internship, and I put it into an info session at Hoover Ridge. I had these little pamphlets, which are pictured in the next slide. I had these little pamphlets with different types of information for the groups to take home. It had previously snowed the night before of my community service, so I was just glad people showed up. <laughs> But they did bring their pets and they told me they learned a lot. I got a lot of good feedback from them. And I brought my own pet, she was there to assist me. And we talked about how the environment, care, diet, all leads into how you as an owner can affect your pet. Because you ultimately choose their food, you choose what they, w what they wear, you choose how their hair is cut, you choose how often they get a bath, you choose when they go on walks, when they don't go on walks, when they play, what they play with. So your pet, you're not owning them, but you're, they're yours. And so you choose everything that goes in to their life. And depending on that, that can change how they behave. If you have a high in agility dog that doesn't get to go on walks, but maybe twice a week, they're gonna be chewing on things and irritating you because they're unhappy, they're bored. And so maybe your lower agility dog who likes to sleep all the time is going to be very unhappy when you take them on walks often because they want to sleep and so it all plays into how your animal's behavior actually is. Miss Teresa was also a guest speaker at my community service event. She was there to help me answer questions, to help back up what I was talking about and to give a more professional stance on how the information is played into the group between pet and animal. This is These images are of my little flyer that I made. Um, I need to put out a great thanks to Miss Lindsay for at Hoover Ridge for allowing me to hold my event there. It was sort of last minute because my previous facility fell through. So it was kind of last minute, but it, it worked perfectly fine. And it was actually greater there because it was a higher open space and the pets were allowed to run around and they got to a good social session. So, but. so my future plans and advice like I previously said, I've always wanted to study some sort of veterinary science. So my plan is to <laughs> do a veterinary technician certificate program through Penn Foster, which is a completely online program. It is sort of like a community college, 
but completely online. So I'm not going to a true facility per se, but I'm getting my veterinary technician certificate. Hopefully either this fall or this spring I'll begin the program. And then if I choose to move forward, I will do a pre-vet program through the same um, education facility, Penn Foster. And then I'll do a fast six-year fast track program to get my doctorate in veterinary medicine at LSU. Um, some advice that I have for the younger generation, the younger BRVJS students, is start earlier. I've always known what I wanted my topic to be, what my presentation was going to be on. It's going to be on animals, vet science. It's going to be great. And then I had my genetics thing all planned out at the beginning of the year, and then it just didn't work out, which is fine. So I had a different backup program, a different backup plan, and then I just went for it. It was in the same topic. It was in something that I enjoyed. And then communication is also the biggest thing. A lot of struggles that I had throughout this entire present this entire project is not my communication, but receiving other communication. I tried different in-person methods. I tried email, phone calls, text messages, anything just to get an answer. <laughs> and sometimes it doesn't always work like that. So you have to try different people. You go through different methods. I use Miss Johnson a lot. She was a wonderful help during my project. Um, I had other family friends that would help me, my parents. Anyone that can help you is just communication for everyone. Um, and then probably my biggest reflection throughout this entire project was I've always wanted to do medical side, but this project really taught me that I like how animals interact with each other and how they interact with people. And so the psychology and things that go into it are a new thing that I found that I really enjoy. So I'm still going to go towards the medical field in the veterinary science type manner but I might do a smaller minor in either animal behavior or training because I just love the way they interact with you, the types of training you can do, anything like that. That was something that I learned throughout my project, and it was just an overall wonderful experience. Thank you guys for watching. Are there any questions? Well, so my, it was kind of both family and from previous experience with different vets. I live on a small farm in Riva, so one of our previous vets actually went to LSU. He graduated from there, and I have family that lives in Louisiana, so <laughs> it's kind of both. <laughs> Oh, oops.
Hello everyone, um, my name is Jackson Taylor, as Ms. Johnson just said, and for my senior BRVGS um, project, I chose to study the mental and physical impacts that coaches have on young athletes. So from a young age, as some of you may know, my dad's coached for 20 some years, so um, uh, coaching and sports have been a big part of my early life. Uh, I played sports from baseball, basketball, golf, um, and even now track. Uh, so coaching has been a big part of my life, and I thought that this would be a fun topic to, uh, to study and find something that I'm already interested in and that has had a huge impact on my life since the beginning. So my research question was how coaches impacted um, young athletes through their coaching techniques um, physically and mentally. Um, so through my uh, external research, um, I was able to uh, um, find that coaching impacts are more spectrum based and there's not one right answer to how coaches impact, um, impact their players. So. Uh, when we look at physical impacts, we usually look at how uh, coaches um, uh, strategize and how they create their game plan. So coaches that utilize a more offensive strategy that's, uh, um, that's more get up and go uh, often uh, have more injuries on their teams because they have to, they're going super fast up and down the court. And um, uh, these strategies uh, can, can uh, deteriorate the, the player's endurance and um, hurt their flexibility and cause muscle elongation. Um, but then on the other side of the spectrum, you have more slower paced teams such as like UVA, who's more defensive orient orientated, and um, they have uh, those those teams usually sustain less injuries, and they promote more strong muscle growth as uh, as they're not moving as much, they're not doing as much on the court, um, and that, that's basically it for the physical impacts. Um, the mental impacts are also spectrum based. So at one end of the spectrum, you have coaches that utilize tough love strategies, which is um, almost being mean to your players at some point. Um, uh, and then on the other spectrum, you have a positive reinforcement where you're always um, basically positively reinforcing what they do, how they play. Um, and so on the positive reinforcement spectrum, you have uh, your players, um, uh, they have a higher confidence level, basically, because you're constantly reinforcing them. But they also don't have the same uh, player to coach hierarchy dy dynamic that you would have on a tough love um, type strategy. So basically, what I realized from my research is that there's not one right answer to how coaches impact. It's more the techniques that coaches use and implement in their practices, game plans, strategies, um, game theory, basically. And yeah, that's what I found from my research. Um, for my internship, I worked at the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, my mentor was um, Jimmy Colladin. He's been a women's basketball coach for nine or 10 years now at the collegiate level. Um, he's had a lot of experience uh, after college with basketball being in and out of the game. Um, so working with him was a fun experience as he was very experienced in the field. Um, so when I was with um, Coach Colladin, I was able to sit in on their practices and see how he um, interacted with his players and um, with the other coaches that he works with. 
Uh, this was in their practice facility, this pitcher. Um, I was also able to sit in on coaches' meeting meetings where they talked about their strategies, um, their game plan, what they were going to do in practice that day, the next day, what their goal for the week was, their upcoming schedule, all of that. Um, and then I also got to listen to, uh, I don't know if you can see, but on the board, that was basically like their plays, their game plan, their theory, um, what offensive offensive strategies they wanted to implement into their games and their practices. Um, we also got to talk about how um, they would run defenses uh, and basically how they wanted to run their team. Yeah, that's basically it. So for my community service, um, as many of you know, uh, our athletic director um, recently passed away this year. And um, as many of you know, he, uh, he had a big impact on a lot of us as he was a wrestling coach, our athletic director. And I thought um, that I would do a community ser service project to honor the memory of, uh, of the impacts that he had on young athletes as related to my project. Um, so basically what I did is um, we held a fundraiser. It was a 50-50 raffle, $5 per ticket. Um, I held it from March 1st to March 18th. Um, there, was a little, there was a little leeway on the ticket selling because we sold a little bit more after the 18th, but um, our main selling was during, during that time. Um, so we... Uh, we were able to sell 1,200 tickets at $5 a ticket, which ended up being six grand in total that we um, collected. Uh, the raffle um, drawing is tonight. Miss Betty Jo Wenham will be selecting um, the winner out of our bucket that we had with all the tickets inside of them. It will be at the baseball game tonight. Um, so here's the tickets that uh, I use. And basically what I did is I took their name, phone, phone number, and email, and I wrote it down on this ticket stub. And you can see where I ripped it off. Um, here's the bucket that we had where we kept all the um, names and tickets in one. And we had a big spreadsheet. I didn't want to put that on there because that was everyone's names and everything on it and the money that they spent. But uh, uh, we used a big spreadsheet to keep up with how much money we had, how much money we needed to get, um, how people paid. We took multiple different forms of uh, cash flow. We had Venmo, Zelle, uh, cash, um, PayPal, and I think checks. I think that was all of it. And uh, we had to consolidate all the money into one place. And um, so the winner of our raffle um, is going to get three thousand dollars it's a big stack of cash um, and then the rest of the money will go to the the other half of the ticket earnings the other three grand will go to the Michael Sacra scholarship fund which we hope will um, that money will go to building a new wrestling room uh, in memory of Mr. Sacra as he was our um, wrestling coach this um, this poster right here was when I got to sell tickets at Macho Man, which is one of our school events. Um, we sold, I think, close to 30 or 40 tickets at that event. Um, but mo the main part of our ticket selling came from uh, online, uh, like advertising online. We posted, and people would send us emails, uh, text messages, and they would how many tickets they wanted. We would get all their information, exchange money, and uh, make sure everything was right with that. Um, as I said earlier, my, all right, I don't know if I said that right, but Miss Betty Jo Wenham was a, my community service mentor. Um, she was able to help me organize this entire event. Uh, she allowed um, me to learn more about how raffles are run and where and when I could sell my tickets and who I could sell them to. And um, 
she helped me with the price scale and my target audience and who I wanted to sell to. That was basically what Miss Betty Jo did for me. Um, my advice to future BRVGS students is just find something that you're interested in. Uh, it took me a while to figure out something that I wanted to do. And once I found something that I was interested in, everyone, or everything just fell into place a lot better. I mean, everything was a lot easier when I was actually interested in doing what I, or what I had to do. Um, my future plans is I'm, uh, I've already accepted, um, been accepted into the University of Virginia. And this fall, I'll be studying um, sociology. And uh, hopefully, after my four years at UVA, I'll try and get into the FBI. Uh, yeah, that's it. And that's it. Any further questions? My mentor took more to a positive reinforcement um, spectrum, but uh, his uh, head, head coach that he serves under is a little bit more uh, tough love oriented. Um, but yeah, he, he was more on the positive reinforcement spectrum uh, with his coaching techniques. Uh, I would like to be a criminal investigator, but I, I also thought about minoring in psychology and being a criminal psychologist and looking into what, why, why they do what they do. So um, I did look, so um, in my expert interview, uh, me and my um, mentor got to talk a lot about um, how players, um, depending on their age and how, um, how they respond to certain things. And um, so basically the lower level is like they respond in different ways to that of, say, a college athlete. And um, that, that was basically it. Any other questions? Is that good?
Um, I don't have an actual pocket. <laughs> yeah, I can just. test. <laughs> All right, everybody, this is Brett from the Rough Nervous, and this is um, Understanding Your Rights and Responsibilities as Adulthood. Hello, my name is Destiny Ruffner, and I will be presenting on the legal rights and responsibilities of adulthood and its impact on society. I have dreamed of becoming an attorney for as long as I remember. I believe I was about six years old when I first began telling people that I was going to be a lawyer when I grew up. Upon first hearing about the BRVGS Senior Project during my freshman year, I instantly knew that I wanted my project to be related to law to allow me to gain exposure to the area, which is exactly what I had done. During my internship with the Commonwealth Attorney, I was tasked with leading the So Your 18 book from the Virginia State Bar, which outlines the legal rights and responsibilities that individuals gain 18, the age of majority. Upon realizing how little I had known about the subject before, Noticing that my peers felt the same way and discussing everything with my mentor, I decided to focus my research on this topic. At the age of 18, many teenagers enter adulthood without having a proper understanding of their legal rights and responsibilities. Without understanding this important information, individuals may find that they are underprepared for adulthood and it can lead to negative consequences for the individual and society. My guiding research question for my project was what is the importance of understanding one's legal rights and responsibilities and what impact does it have on individuals and society? Through my research and my project, I found strong evidence to support that civic education through um, understanding and acting upon one's rights and responsibilities is very beneficial for individuals and society. Regarding individuals, knowing this information can lead to easier navigation of life, understanding what to do in certain situations, preventing others from taking advantage, protecting one's freedoms, and more. Regarding society, knowing this information, <laughs> regarding society, knowing this information can um, uphold the constitutional democracy of the United States, um, in, leads to an increase in civic engagement, safer communities, and more. And this um, research is further supported by evidence from my community service, which I will discuss later. A major focus on my project lies in the importance of educating and being educated. As Desiderius Erasmus once said, the main hope of a nation lies in the proper education of its youth. This not only applies to traditional schooling, but also to civic education and understanding how to apply learning steps to one's life. This past summer, I had the opportunity to intern with the Madison County Commonwealth Attorney, Ms. Clarissa Berry. After shadowing Ms. Berry for a day in 2020, I decided to reach out to her to express my interest in a summer internship this past summer. My mentor for both my internship and my community service was Clarissa Berry, the current, current Commonwealth Attorney, the current elected Commonwealth Attorney of Madison County. Prior to being elected, Ms. Berry had graduated from the University of Virginia and the University of Richmond School Law, of Law. As the Commonwealth Attorney, Ms. Berry prosecutes misdemeanors and felonies, continuously maintaining Madison as a safe community. She works to pursue justice and to ensure the protection of constitutional and legal rights. During my internship, I learned about the daily life and duties of a prosecutor and the ins and outs of the Virginia court system. I had the opportunity to attend general district court and circuit court with Ms. Berry, as well as the deputy commonwealth attorney, Wade Gelbert, and the assistant commonwealth attorney, Alexander Hamilton. During my internship, I enjoyed being able to watch each of the attorneys present and defend their cases and to discuss the outcomes and any questions that I had afterwards. Each of the individuals that I had met, including attorneys, judges, lawyers, officers, and other legal professionals were very instrumental in my learning experience. One of my favorite parts of my internship was having the opportunity to observe a jury trial from start to finish. The jury trial took place in the Madison County Circuit Court, and this was actually the first jury trial to take place since the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020. Prior to the trial, I observed the selection of the jury. A pool of 50 prospective jurors were brought in, and the number was narrowed down to 12 using a strike system, which is a multi-step process in which potential jurors are removed from a pool based on questions asked by the 
asked by the attorneys until they reach their desired number. This is done in order to ensure the selection of a group of individuals that can come to a fair and impartial verdict. The Commonwealth was represented by the Deputy Commonwealth's Attorney Wade Gelbert and the defendant was represented by a court-appointed attorney. Um, during the trial, I observed each of the attorneys present their opening statements using strong points and evidence after the judge reviewed the charges of the case. Several pieces of evidence were presented, including photos, videos, maps, um, screenshots of text messages, recordings of emergency calls, as well as several witnesses who were called to testify. Following the closing statements of each of the attorneys, the jury went to a separate room in order to review and discuss the case and come to their final um, verdict. Following the conclusion of the trial, each of the Madison County attorneys were generous enough to answer all of my questions regarding the case, the verdict, the meaning of certain terms, as well as why certain things did or did not happen the way that they did. I enjoyed being able to watch the entire case unfold in person and to be able to gain a deeper understanding of everything by talking to the lawyers and the interns. On March 4, 2021, I hosted the Now the Year 18, the Legal Rights and Responsibilities of Adulthood Assembly to inform the Madi seniors at Madison County High School of what to expect when they reach adulthood at the age of 18. I worked closely with several community leaders who offered their expertise and agreed to be guest speakers in my assembly. These individuals included the Commonwealth Attorney Clarissa Berry, Wade Gelbert, the Deputy Commonwealth Attorney, Investigators Frank Herman and Scott Woodward of the Madison County Sheriff's Office, and Warren Eames, the Director of Elections. This program was very effective in delivering an informative and engaging presentation based on the Virginia State Bar and the expertise of the guest speakers. Prior to the assembly, I worked closely with each of the with each of the guest speakers by holding in them by holding meetings both individually and as a group to discuss my goals for the project and each of their roles. We also worked together to develop a set of topics that we felt were important for the students to understand. I then used this information to develop a presentation that we displayed during the assembly, which included photos, resources, and all of the major topics that were discussed by the guest speakers. And um, students were also provided with their own copies of the So You're 18 book to read more in-depth information on the topics that were covered. Ms. Clarissa Berry, the Commonwealth's attorney, discussed the basics of turning 18, um, further resources for more information, as well as the Virginia court system. Wade Gelbert, the deputy Commonwealth's attorney, discussed internet safety, online reputation, and the advantages and disadvantages of social media. Investigators Scott Woodward and Frank Herman of the Madison County Sheriff's Office discussed driving, traffic stops, um, the process of arrest and bonds, as well as Miranda rights. And Lauren Eames, the Director of Elections, discussed voter registration and voting. During this portion of the assembly, eligible students also had the opportunity to register to vote um, if they were going to be 18 before the November 2nd election. Following the conclusion of the assembly, students had the opportunity to ask any questions that they had of the guest speakers. To measure the success of this event, I conducted a post-survey of the senior class. 100% of respondents felt more informed of their legal rights and responsibilities in the assembly. When asked how beneficial the assembly was on a scale of 1 to 5, approximately 65% of students rated it a 4 or a 5, while 30% rated it a 3. In the survey, four follow-up questions based on the content of the, pre of the presentation were asked in order to determine the effectiveness of the assembly and conveying important information to the students. Of these four questions, there was an 88.5% average accuracy rate, two of which had a 100% average accuracy rate. This statistical evidence supports that the presentation was well received, as well as effective in teaching the students of their legal rights and responsibilities. The assembly was a huge success and it will have the legacy of informing the local seniors in my community about their legal rights and responsibilities and assisting them in being informed adults and citizens. There are also plans in place for this presentation and program to take place annually to continue educating the upcoming classes of seniors and generations of informed adults and citizens. I've had a wonderful, I'm very grateful for this wonderful experience as well as for each of the individuals who are involved in my project. Through this experience, I've had the opportunity to learn more about my future career path, gain valuable insight, make several professional connections, and make a positive impact on my community. In the fall, I plan to attend the University of Virginia to study on the pre-law track prior to attending law school to become an attorney. 
This project has further solidified my passion for studying law and becoming an attorney in the future. My biggest piece of advice for future seniors in the VRBGS program is to, not, is to not be afraid of reaching out, whether it's for an internship, advice, an answer to a question, a mentor, or anything else related to your project. There are so many people who are willing to help you and offer ins insight that will be valuable to you, your project, and your future. Communication is key, and this project has certainly strengthened my skills in that area. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. It was. Um, we did it, I believe it was during first block, and we divided it into two different sessions um, based on whether the students were a semester one government student or a semester two government student. Um, so all seniors had the opportunity to attend. Um, well, I'm very interested by um, like the prosecution side of things um, that Ms. Barry does as a Commonwealth attorney. But um, during college, I hope to look more into different areas since I haven't had exposure to those. So I'm not entirely sure what area, but I certainly want to be an attorney. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm gonna get some water, but then it'd be like ASMR. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you.
sports chiropractics and how it enhances athletic performance. Yes. All right. So as Ms. Johnson said, I'm Jewel Krop, and I chose to research the topic of how athletes would benefit from chiropractic care. So I want to give a little bit of background so you can understand why I chose this topic and why it's so meaningful to me. So this is a picture of me running at the state track meet last year where I placed second in the girls 300 meter hurdle race. Sports have been a big part of my life ever since I was younger, so I knew I wanted to pick a topic that had some relation to sports. For anyone who has participated in sports, you know that you build a very strong bond with the other players on your team and especially when you've been playing with them for a long period of time. And I think this is certainly true in a small community like Madison, where you play parts in your sports with kids at a young age, and then you eventually are playing with those same people in high school sports. So this is my best friend, Lindsay McDaniel, and we've played parts in your sports together, middle school sports together, high school sports together, and I think that our friendship has strengthened so much through our shared love and passion for sports. Um, during her junior year, she unfortunately tore her ACL, which forced her to withdraw herself from sports for the rest of that year. And then again, in her senior year, she tore her other ACL, um, causing her to withdraw from sports for the rest of what would be her senior year of high school sports. So that's a big deal for somebody who has played sports all their life, and when it's a big part of who you are, you don't like to see that happen to somebody close to you, and you certainly don't want it to happen to yourself. Um, but Everyone, when going into sports, you would expect to experience some type of injury, whether that be in yourself or be in somebody else. But as it comes to somebody closer to you, it just makes it that much more of a reality. And for me, I went to look into ways that common sports injuries like this can be prevented and how the recovery process can be shortened if that, if that is possible. This is my older sister, Jerrica. And uh, when she was in high school, we found out that she had scoliosis. And um, this is a medical condition where there is a, a curvature of the spine. And it caused her a lot of pain and discomfort when she did activities for a long period of time. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to get emotional saying this. <laughs> Me and my sister are very close, if you can't tell. <laughs> okay. um, so. I had first learned about sports chiropractic through her, um, or not sports chiropractic, but chiropractic in general through her, um, because the only option to fix her scoliosis was through a very expensive and high risk surgery. And it didn't seem very realistic for her at the time with her being so young and being a high school athlete herself. And so I wanted to turn to chiropractic because I had learned about it through her. And what interested me so much about it is that there was a natural practice out there that would use the body and adjust the body itself so that it would heal itself and offer some sort of like pain medication. And I think this natural alternative is very ideal for athletes that are very aware of what enters their bodies. And um, it made me want to research um, how the chiropractic practices would be able to benefit athletes. So I gained a lot of insight into my research question through my internship at Scott Wagner's Integrated Medicine. Scott Wagner is a chiropractor for the University of Virginia, um, and he has his business located in the town of Charlottesville, which is where I spent most of my time. Um, I did not get the opportunity to shadow Scott Wagner myself, but these are two of the chiropractors in the office that I did get the chance to shadow. Um, and the, on the left is Dr. Ben, and on the right is Dr. Mike. And I just watched them administer many adjustments to patients, and I got to see behind the scenes of what a chiropractor does, and they answered any questions that I had about chiropractic. This is a digital motion x-ray, which acts as a normal x-ray would, but it records a person performing some type of movement so that the chiropractor does not only see the problem within the patient, but they can see the point in time that the problem is occurring within the patient. And with this advanced technology, it just allows them to offer uh, a better treatment plan for the patient. And all patients are required to get x-rays bef before receiving any type of adjustment or any treatment plan when they enter into the building because they want to offer more individualized treatment plans for the patients so that they are getting the most out of their treatment. Since Scott Wagner does use an integrated approach towards healing and not just chiropractic, I was able to shadow David, who was a physical therapist in the office as well. 
and he just helps um, with um, helping patients do exercises and um, he makes sure that they're doing them correctly and helps them get into more of the complex equipment and things like, like that. So this is the physical therapy room where patients spend a majority of their time doing their exercises. They check in and receive a list of exercises that they have to do for the day and they can be seen and adjusted by a chiropractor either before or after doing their exercises. And these brown tables at the front are the adjustment tables that are there for patient's convenience, but there are also rooms with adjustment tables if they want a more private setting as well. I want to show you all some of the equipment that I found to be super interesting and I had the chance to use while I was there. And this is an anti-gravity treadmill, and the way this works is you get strapped into the machine, and it's set at 100% body weight to start, which is how you would normally feel when walking on a treadmill. But as you decrease the body weight percentage that you feel, it relieves pressure from the lower portion of your bodies. And what's so cool about this is that it can be used by patients who are in various stages of the recovery process. It can be used by a person who maybe went through a tragic accident and may just be learning how to walk again, and it can be used by an athlete who maybe wants to run for a long period of time without putting too much stress on their joints. This is the All Core 360 machine, and the way that this works is you get strapped into the chair, and the chair is set at an angle which you rotate three times clockwise and three times counterclockwise. And the purpose of this is to provide a low impact core stability exercise for patients to help improve their posture. As the angle um, decreases, it just becomes more of a challenge. And with it being a low impact core exercise, it can be used by patients who are in that various stages of the recovery process as well. As far as my uh, community service is concerned, I had planned on hosting a kickball fundraising event where the different grade levels would compete against each other in a tournament, as um, Nate had mentioned before. Uh, this did not turn out how we expected it to, just because we didn't receive a lot of player signups. Um, but all the money that we had hoped to raise from this event was going to go towards providing mass and athletics with new e recovery equipment for their athletes, which I'll show in the next few slides. Um, and we do still plan on hosting an event similar to this in the future to at least get a fund started to get this equipment because I think it's important that Madison starts placing an emphasis on taking that precautionary act action to help and reduce the amount of common injuries within our athletes. So this is the TheraBody Wave Series, and all of these are vibrating devices that help to relieve muscle tension and increase mobility. On the left is a variation of rollers. The one with the ridge in it is specific to the back, neck, and um, the one that's more flat is used to cover larger areas of the body. The TheraBody Dot is used to target areas that the rollers just can't reach as well. This is the TheraBody Air Recovery System, which I know when I mentioned to many of our athletes, they were excited to have an opportunity to use something like this. Um, so it uses compressed air to offer what I can describe as a air massage, like pressured air massage, to help um, improve blood flow circulation and relieve muscle tension and just aid in that recovery process. The vest is used to target the chest, back, shoulder, and arm. They can be adjusted for the right or left arm. And then the boots are used to target the lower back, core, hips, legs, and feet. As far as my future plans, I plan on attending Duke University in the fall, where I'll be majoring in biology and entering into their certification program for innovation and entrepreneurship. And the cool thing about this program is that it's very similar to this Governor School Senior Project that we're doing right now. So I thought it was interesting that um, over the span of three years, I'll be able to do what I'm doing in just a semester with Ms. Johnson and Governor School. So I thought it was cool that I got to look, get a little insight into that. Um, and after graduating college, I plan to go to a chiropractic school where I will get my Doctor of Chiropractic license. And with this education, I plan to start my own sports chiropractic business so that I can advertise to college sports teams and eventually professional sports teams like the NFL. As far as my future advice to Governor School students, I would, not, uh, I would plan to either start early on your college applications and taking into consideration that you're not just going to be focusing on um, your governor school project your senior year, you're going to have that college applications, you're going to have scholarships applications, and you're going to have your senior project on top of that. 
So either uh, plan to start early on one of those in the summer. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it has to be the Governor's School Project because for me, it didn't work out with my schedule. I worked a lot in the summer and starting the internship or community service stuff during the summer didn't really work out for me. So I started early on like my personal essay or something like that. So that wasn't so much stress going into my senior year. I'm going to thank everyone for listening to my presentation today. Are there any questions about me or anything I mentioned in the presentation? So for her case, it couldn't be used to completely fix everything. It was used to help tolerate that pain. And it helped when she was using it. She just hasn't turned to it all recently. Yes, so um, Duke only has for chiropractic school I would need a major in some area of the body so they have biology with a concentration in anatomy and biochemistry and so I would use that and go into chiropractic school so chiropractic uses natural means of healing rather than using invasive practices that medical schools use like surgeries and stuff like that just because um, and the reason I thought I would do this with sports is because a lot of time players may have to get surgeries but they can turn to chiropractic care and then get surgeries in the off season so that they're not missing out too much on their sport. Yes, I would go to a chiropractic school after college. Yes, when I looked into my study, um, specific to sports medicine teams and the addition of chiropractors, there is a big controversy there. Um, but I think what I researched and when doing my research was that a lot of the players feel more comfortable having a doctor in a more specialized area, whereas having a doctor who covers a more broad range of areas. Thank you. Any other questions? in here. Can you hold this for a second? Tuck it in. Is it a little bit more hidden? Is that good? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. So if I... Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Oh. Awesome. Yay. Yeah, I think so. Thanks. <laughs> My parents are really bugging this out. Oh my gosh. I'm <laughs> bugging this out. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh 
Oh, sorry. I was thinking that, but I was like, I don't know if it's on here. Okay. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, next we have Kate Young, and she um, focuses on archaeology and um, the enlightenment of the previously enslaved through archaeology. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. As Ms. Johnson just said, my focus on my senior capstone project was the enlightenment of the previously enslaved through archaeology. My internship was at James Mass in Montpelier from the week of July 12th to July 16th, so it was very hot out in the sun all day excavating, but my days usually consisted between 8 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon or sometimes 8 to 4. Each day varied because I was interning through a dig camp that they offer at Montpelier, which was thankfully paid through governor school, so I didn't have to pay for it. And so each day was a uh, revolved around maybe excavating and also going on lots of tours around the property, just getting more historical information and also learning more about archaeology, of course. So first here on my left, you can see the excavation unit I was in all week. In the middle is the shovel test pit survey, which is basically a hole dug so you can see the different layers of subsoil throughout so you know when to stop digging because of what time period that you're in. And so there won't be any artifacts there because the Montpelier, Montpelier family wasn't there yet. And so in the middle is my first artifact that I found, which may seem like a boring piece of metal to probably some of you guys, but this was very interesting for me to find in the very hot week of July. I think I found it probably my second day of digging, so it was kind of like a picture of motivation because there is something in my unit, thankfully. <laughs> and so in the last photo is me holding the trowel, which is the most commonly used tool that I use throughout this week to just slightly scrape up the dirt throughout my unit to hopefully uncover more artifacts. And my unit was believed to be the blacksmith shop at Montpelier because of the amounts of slag that was found in that area. And slag is pictured here on the left, which is basically just clumps of burnt iron that was used to weld uh, like maybe tools or more like commonly used things around the homestead that was found lots of it wasn't found in my unit specifically because my unit was very separate from the rest of the units it was down the hill but it still had a lots of hits on the metal detector so they still wanted to uncover it to see what was truly in it so that is slag and then in the middle is called the sifter and that's what we would use as we would excavate and uncover dirt we would almost like dust pan mop it up to be able to pour it in duck it buckets and with this we sifted that dirt because there could be potential artifacts that was found there so that's me and my unit partner sifting and here in this first picture, you can truly see the benefits of sifting because I found a split nail that I missed excavating that I was able to find in the sifter. When meanwhile, I was not able to find it otherwise. And so in the middle is me using a Japanese trowel, which is different than the first trowel because the Japanese trowel is able to uncover a lot more dirt. And you use that when you know that you're not close to artifacts because the Japanese trowel could easily just shred a fragile artifact because it's so sharp. And as you can see, I'm kind of uneven in my ground layers. I'm already digging a deep hole right there. And then my probably my most interesting artifact that I found throughout the week was a piece of glass, although there was a very cool buckle found in my unit that I didn't get to find. But I found a piece of glass, so that was cool. And so the last day of the unit was almost like our clean our cleaning day that we used to organize all the artifacts. You can see my unit partner here is picking at it with almost like a dentist toothpick and it was almost like we're using like a little dentistry day because then we would scrub at it with a toothbrush too. And so here's all the artifacts that we found on the right in my unit. And this is actually really motivating because there is some units that only found maybe five nails while there's other unit that found over 100 nails. So it was just like, depending on your location what you're able to find. But thankfully I was able to have some hits. And so here is my before and after of my unit. Um, before is kind of like the picture that you wouldn't want to catalog. It has all like the dirt buckets and everything around it. And then last, you can kind of see their pull and their like their labeling of the unit in the bottom. And this is not the very last time that my unit was touched. That my mentor still had to go over and do a cleaning pass and still really excavate it till its full potential until almost like a month later. And so here is everybody I worked with through my internship. On the left is Dr. Reeves. I conducted my expert interview with him. He was a huge help for resources, um, maintaining like connection with me for the Montpelier descendant community. And he still reaches out to me today, just giving me information on things that I may be interested in, like cemetery cleanups for enslaved cemeteries. And then on the right is Lizzie and Emily. Lizzie was a major help. She was my mentor who taught me almost everything about I know about archaeology. And then Emily is their lab intern, not their field lab intern, who was able to help me with just regular volunteering there back at Montpelier. 
but they are both um, chosen out of the most heavily um, applicant pool yet at Montpelier, so it was very, it was a pleasure to work with them. And so my uh, research question was how does archaeology allow for a greater understanding of the previously enslaved and how can this relate to disadvantages of enslaved descendants? I was motivated for this research topic because of two tours I did at Montpelier. Their first tour was a tour of the um, cemeteries there. First was the Madison Family Cemetery which had these big obliques and like massive just cemetery stones reflecting the Madison family and their close relatives. And then as we made the journey into the slave cemetery, I was imagining just the hundreds of headstones that would be there because there was over hundreds of slaves at Montpelier. But sadly, it was just grass. There was no memorialization because slaves weren't treated as human beings. So I realized that this is, has to be difficult for enslaved descendants because they are unable to really memorialize their ancestors. And so the second museum is located at the basement of the Montpelier mansion. It's called the Mere Distinction of Color Museum. And here on the left, as we first enter this museum, we were told to describe, to see if any of these descriptions fit us. And on this, they're very harsh descriptions as like, I was property, I was survivor, and I was raped. Things that are very hard that most of us may not be able to see a description as us as well. And then on the right is a quote from James Madison himself saying that the two races cannot coexist, both being free and equal. And it was my, um, my motivation in my research paper to research how there are still injustices in society today. So based on a constitutional aspect of injustices, James Madison impacted this in particular by expanding the amount of yearly limits of the slave trade. And then this yearly limit, the enslaved population in the United States nearly doubled. Because of this, southern states got more representation through the Electoral College because they had a larger population because of the three-fifths compromise. Current injustices are voter suppression, like felony disenfranchisement and curbing registration drives that particularly targets people of color. And then on the right is a map of redlining, which occurred around the 1900s, which is governmental city maps that um, set grades on cities, and the lower grades were received to areas that had a larger population of people of color in them. Because of this, people didn't want to own real estate in those areas, and so their tax funding automatically was decreased, which really impacted school systems. And so for my community service, I work with Mary Minkoff. Mary Minkoff provided me a lot of context to the Montpelier Senate community as to what I wished to accomplish, but sadly there was just too much going on with dispute as the Montpelier Senate community was just made that summer, so it was kind of hard to get contacts as they were just new. And so Mary, thankfully, I was able to have access to the massive database that Montpelier has there. As you can see here, all the yellow dots are signs and all the yellow trails are trails of cost. They have over thousands of acres at Montpelier that I was able to walk all of them and go through the trails and make notes of signs that had damages, of signs that maybe in the trails had a tree fall on them, and signs that weren't even in the, um, in the database themselves, so they weren't like, located on them. So I was able to go through, and here is a sign by Fizzer Center, me like cleaning before and after, and overall I think I did find two signs that had carvings of damage in them, and a couple signs in the trails were not in the mapping of the database. So here is a picture of me graduating almost my archaeology internship, and so I would use this as my advice to younger grammar school students would to be to step out of your comfort zone because I had no really knowledge of anything historically related or archaeology, and I developed this like massive interest of what it's like and to experience it. And then in the future, I'll be attending the University of Virginia, but I won't be majoring in anything archaeology related because there was a day of my internship, thankfully, that I had to sit down and talk with the other doctors and interns there, and they described to me what the process you have to go to and the almost the salary you make, and it was just not a stable job for me. So I like to um, I plan to be a statistician major in data science at UVA. That's it.
<laughs> yeah, it took my lab partner, I think, another day after that to find her first artifact, and I continued to find them, so I think that she was getting very frustrated. <laughs> she was like, because we were working, like, I was like on the left half, and she was on the right half. She was like, can we switch halves? So I was like, no, I'm keeping my half. <laughs> yeah. Yes? On the blacksmith site. There was also, there's other blacksmith sites there. Actually, there's two of them. I think they're so popular just because they were using so many tools harvesting in the fields.
want it to be on. I think I just leave it off. <laughs> So, like Ms. Shankla said, my name is Haley Walker, and I researched into how service organizations impact small communities. So, I chose this topic because in the summer of 2021, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do for my internship and really just trying to start planning, um, I was passionate about pursuing a career in nursing, and then so I called to multiple different offices and finally got one. And then for my community service, I chose to work with animals in the animal shelters because I've always loved animals and I've had a passion for <laughs> improving um, their lives and stuff. So my s research question was, how do service, organiza service organizations significantly impact small communities? And through my research, I found that not only does um, like service organizations and community service impact obviously the community itself, but it also impacts um, the person volunteering just because it really, you know, it makes them feel good deep down. And um, in a study by the Central California SPCA, it was shown that working with animals actually lowers a person's blood pressure and their stress levels by a significant amount. So for my professional learning experience, I interned at the Health and Wellness Medical Services. I interned at the Charlottesville Clinic for part of the day on my first day and then I traveled back up to Madison where I finished out the rest of my 20 hours. And there I, there I worked with Jenny Furlow, which is on the left. She was an MPC there. She was the only nurse practitioner in the office. So we had one nurse practitioner and one um, MA, which is on the right. Her name was Mariah Graves. And I followed Mariah more than I followed Jenny just because Jenny did more in-depth care and stuff like that. I followed Mariah to do um, blood draws and vitals and just all the simple things. Um, this picture shows one of the rooms that we had. This was our most commonly used room just because it had a lot more space than the other ones did. Um, this I thought was pretty neat. They had a mental health room which was also the virtual appointment room and I just thought this really showed how much they cared for their patients and stuff that they had a kind of like a decompressing room for them to just be able to talk and let out what they needed to without sitting on like an exam table or if they had you know an eating disorder history they would take them into this room instead just because it helped them not have to think about being at the doctor thinking about what their issues were. Um, this was an eye exam chart. I did a lot of eye exams. I actually did Irwin's eye exam when he came to the clinic on my second day and I did over I believe it was 20 eye exams throughout my 20 hours that I was there. And this is a centrifuge, so this was used to spin the blood to get the solution in the tube separated from your red blood cells. And I learned a lot about the centrifuge because I, I didn't use it a lot, but I watched Mariah use it a lot. <laughs> and it was just neat to see how the blood separated and just how that works. And this was their blood caddy cart, which you might have seen in Anna's presentation as well. So there's different kinds of tops. So the green tops are just green tops, purple tops, yellow tops, and then I'm gonna step right here. These tops right here, they're called tiger tube tops. You can't really see it in that picture, but they have like a tiger pattern to the top of them. And each of the tubes have different um, mixtures in them already that mixes with the bloods and they do different things and they check for different things. 
And that's just a chart saying all the tube tops and how many times you have to like swish it like this before you can put it in the centrifuge to mix it. And then for my community service, I hosted a donation drive for the local animal shelters. And so I put up flyers around the school and I also put some up around the community, like in the library, Cardinal Homes Center, um, Food Lion. And I hosted it for a month and I asked for food bowls, um, carriers, outdoor houses, collars, stuff like that. I actually called around to a few of the animal shelters just to see what they were in need the most, which was surprisingly actually outdoor houses is what a lot of them needed the most, and then obviously food. So it was actually pretty successful. My whole trunk was full, plus my back seat, and thanks to fellow classmates that helped me load my car for that. <laughs> and just an out, this is just to show, the Madison Animal Hospital actually donated almost 12 like large bags of dog food so that was really awesome and here was some of the cats just enjoying the donations and thanks to Natalie for coming with me to donate those and here's me with one of the cats so just a reflection on my project I learned a lot from this experience just going out of my comfort zone trying to find ways to you know call people and you know it didn't always work out and just having to communicate well and stuff, and I actually experienced a um, pretty big bump in the road when my mentor quit and didn't let me know, and then I had to abruptly end my internship was very sad, but it just showed that you got to be able to communicate, and it really helped to communicate, to communicate to the animal shelters and just be able to see how I was impacting what, you know, their service organization and stuff. And then just advice to future governor school students is just plan, 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 really have a plan set, have a backup plan. Just take the initiative to call out. Don't be afraid to hear no. It'll be okay. You'll find something else. It's not a big deal. <laughs> and for my future plans, I hope to attend a community college in the fall and just get a general studies associate's degree and then maybe go to a four year and major in maybe private investigation or some kind of criminal law and then maybe minor in animal advocacy. And do you have any questions? <laughs> uh, MA, a medical assistant. So she basically did everything maybe like a nurse could, but there was a few things that maybe she couldn't do, so it was pretty close to a nurse though. <laughs> I think that's it. Put it on your other side, just the cord will be better.
Hello everyone. Um, my project was focused on the role of physical therapy in sports, as Ms. Johnston said. So I was interested in this topic due to my own experience in sports with injuries from sports that caused me to go to physical therapy for several months at a time. And during that time, I became interested in how the body works to basically heal itself through different therapies, such as massage therapies or stretching, doing exercises. So I became interested in this topic, and which made me want to do my project um, based around my internship at Spectrum Physical Therapy in Rutgersville. Um, I interned during the week of July 12th through the 16th for four hours a day, and I went in and shadowed the different um, therapists there. So in this picture, we have Kyle, Megan, Andrew, and Josh was a tech there. Um, as you can see, everyone in the picture is wearing pink because it was Josh's last day and he was known for wearing pink to work, so they wanted to support him on his last day and have a pink day. Um, so during my internship, I just shadowed the different therapists. Uh, not one specifically, I kind of just jumped around to whoever was working with someone at the time. Um, so I got to see them do massage therapies, stretching, which took up most of the time and then also just showing the patients how to do different exercises, whether it be new exercises or learning um, new ways to fix the ones that they've been doing to make it harder as they progress through their um, rehab. So one of the more interesting forms of therapy that I got to see while I was there was dry needling, which was similar to acupuncture. Um, it uses needles to target muscles that are harder to reach with normal forms of therapy, such as stretching or massaging. Um, so they use the needles to stimulate the muscles, causing them to tense up. It's usually used for muscles near the spine, but while I was there, they um, tested it on a calf muscle so I could see how it works, and you could see the muscle like tensing up when it hit the targeted area. So that was interesting to see. Um, and then also while I was there, I got to help out with just getting some tables ready for the next patients if they needed me to help out. Um, I wasn't able to get any pictures of myself doing it because they had a no photo policy in the facility, but this is something similar to what I was doing. Um, so while I was there, I was interested to see just how much each of the therapists knew about basically every part of the body because none of them were specializing in one specific body part. They kind of, like one patient might have a shoulder injury and then a knee injury, so they had to know the names of a bunch of different muscles and ligaments and how they all work together. So I thought that was interesting to see. Um, and then another major thing that I picked up on during my internship was just the importance of asking questions when you're in an unfamiliar environment. So the first day, I wasn't really getting as much out of the experience because I wasn't very comfortable and I wasn't asking enough questions when I didn't really know what was going on. So as the week went on, I started to ask more and more about why they wanted to do a certain exercise or um, just how they thought through the different processes of um, formulating a plan for how they would treat a, treat a patient. And my mentors were very helpful in giving thorough answers and just encouraging me, encouraging me to ask more questions. Um, and then another major thing that I learned was just the importance of having a positive relationship with coworkers and patients or clients, whoever you're working with. Um, I noticed that each of the therapists was just able to have a personalized conversation with their patients, which helped the process just go smoother and made the patients be happy to be there, even if they weren't happy with their progress that they were making or whatever it may be. Um, so for my research, I researched what the significance of physical therapy is related to sports injuries, both prevention and recovery. So I, most of the studies that I went through were comparing the effects of physical therapy to how injuries could be prevented or recovered from without therapy or through different treatments. And I found that it's um, very helpful for both cases, especially prevention because it involves just preparing muscles or joints to, for whatever activity they may be participating in. Um, and then recovering, it just helps to speed up the process um, even more. So for my community service, I hosted a youth sports equipment donation drive on December 18th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And all of the equipment that I was able to get went to Madison County Parks and Rec for them to give out to children whose families aren't able to afford the equipment that they need for their sport. 
Um, so here's a picture of me and my mentor, Ms. Winham, at the donation drive. Um, we set up a table outside the high school and just collected donations during that time. And here are most of the donations that I got. It was mostly soccer equipment with some cleats and different goalie equipment and some basketball shoes and football cleats as well. So this is me dropping it off at the office for them to keep it there, as I said, until they have people who may need it. Um, so during this process, the main thing that I learned about myself was just my ability to adapt to changes that I didn't really see coming, such as having to come up with a new community service idea after my first one kind of fell through. So I was just able to um, realize my strength of being able to adapt kind of on the fly. So for future students, I would just advise them not to wait to plan certain parts of their project. I know for myself, I didn't really think much about my community service in the beginning. I was more focused on my internship. Um, so I think it would just be a little bit easier to have a general idea of everything that they wanted to do, even if they don't know every single detail. Um, and then this fall, I would be attending the University of Virginia to major in finance. Thank you for listening. Are there any more questions? No, it was more of just like a topic of interest, not something that I want to pursue as a career. No, I didn't have it done to me. They actually, it wasn't very common. Only one of the therapists there was certified to do it. So I only got to see it once. Um, but it basically just uses the needles to, as I said, like target muscles that are harder to get to. And sometimes it can also be used just if the muscles don't respond well to normal forms of therapy. Yeah. Yeah, and just to sort of strengthen them a little bit.
if I insist. <laughs> to start. <laughs> Thanks for waiting. <laughs> I know. Hello everyone, my name is Natalie Coates and my senior capstone project was an analysis of criminals in today's society and the picture you see on the screen is from my internship which I'm going to talk about in a, few, in a later slide. So I chose the topic of criminology and criminal justice because it's something that I've always been interested in learning more about and I also wanted an internship that I knew I would enjoy, that I would find interesting and the capstone project offered just that and a great opportunity to do so. So my research question was why is criminology important as crime rates increase? So criminology is the study of why people choose to commit crimes and this is important because law enforcement can use that data to maybe prevent future crimes from happening if they know like the signs leading up to why people commit crimes. And then one of the leading causes of criminal behavior is upbringing like your childhood and how you're raised because from a young age you're influenced by your parents' beliefs, what they say to you, and what they teach you. And the major, one of the major criminal activities in Madison is just domestic disputes, which is where maybe there's an argument, the police are called, and then they'll show up and solve the problem. So my internship was conducted with the Madison County Sheriff's Office. Here I am sitting in front, the driver's seat of the police car. <laughs> I never drove it. <laughs> so it mainly consisted of ride-alongs because the car is essentially the police officer's office. It's where they spend most of their time. And so the ride-alongs, it was mainly writing tickets. So we would go somewhere on 29, we would stop, the officer would cut on their radar, and they would wait for someone to come speeding past. They would cut on their <laughs> blue lights, and then we would zoom, chase them. <laughs> so that was the best part of my project. <laughs> but um, 
So yeah, they would either issue a summons, which is the equivalent of a ticket, or they would just give them a warning. And I also had the opportunity to watch court, traffic court specifically, where they reviewed the ticket charge with the judge. They went over how fast they were driving. And the judge, they were either issued, they could pay the fine or they could go to traffic school where they would, the ticket would be wiped from their record. So it was really cool to be able to see like the whole process of like the traffic ticket and how that all played out. And one event I helped the police department with was Drug Take Back Day, which is held in association with the DEA. And this is an event where citizens in Madison County can bring their prescription drugs to the sheriff's office where they will then be properly disposed of. So people would bring their prescription medicines and then I would mark off their personal information with a black Sharpie and then it would go in one of these boxes right there. And as you can see, a little later, farther back in the picture, that's what a full bag looked like. And then we filled about four of those. And when the event was concluded, I rode with an officer to the state police headquarters in Culpeper, where the drugs were then disposed of at an undisclosed location. And another event I helped the sheriff's office with was Trick or Trunk. And this was a great opportunity because I went to Trick or Trunk as a child, so it was a great opportunity to be able to help now. So for this event, I dressed as a convict with Investigator Herman. I'm not sure what he is, but <laughs> um, so I helped him with that and we handed out candy. And I also was in charge of counting the participants. I had a little clicker that I would count and I ended up counting 4,000 people came to the event. So my internship mentor was Captain Troy Estes. He's the captain at the police department. And he made sure that I had a really well-rounded experience because, like I said, I was able to do a lot of ride-alongs and I was also able to watch court. And one day I was even able to watch body cam footage from a traffic stop that they were going to use in court. And he was also very helpful in providing me with scholarly resources for my research paper. So my community service mentor was Brad Miller. <laughs> he is the government teacher here at Madison and I knew that he would be a great mentor because of his vast knowledge of government because that is what my community service pertained to. So my community service was called Government Day and it gave high school seniors the opportunity to shadow a member of our local government for the morning and I had the opportunity to shadow Mr. Gelbert who is pictured and this idea actually came to me when I was shadowing him for my internship I was talking with the judge, we were getting to know each other, and he said that Green has a program where s students can shadow members of their government. And I thought that was awesome, and I wanted to implement something similar in Madison. So that's how the event came to fruition. Here are some of the mentors who participated. I communicated with them mostly through email, because they all have emails. And <laughs> so I went on the county website, and I searched for all their emails. I ended up emailing 50 or so government officials. And I got responses back from quite a few. Unfortunately, there weren't enough students interested as there were mentors. But hopefully, in the future, when this event is continued by Mr. Miller, there will be a greater number of students interested. And we can have the same amount of students and mentors. So we have Mr. Jerry Carpenter. He's Parks and Rec. Salim Humphrey works with the Department of Social Services. Lita Lab works, works in the court system. Jamie Wilkes is a building official. And then Brian Gordon is in charge of 911 calls. And then Sarah McKnight is an investigator with the sheriff's office. So here are all the students that participated. And I also communicated with them through email. I got a list of all the seniors from a teacher. And I sent out just a general description of the day, see if they would be interested in participating. And they all responded with that they would be interested. So there were nine students in total, including me. Unfortunately, one of the students was sick, but she was supposed to be with EMS. And I believe she was going to have the opportunity to ride an ambulance. But yeah, so their only suggestion for the event that was maybe next time, it would be a little longer because it wasn't a, mor a morning event. It, was, it ran from 8 to 11. So throughout this process, I learned about myself that I am capable 
of doing things that I would have originally not thought possible, like government day because I had to email and phone call a bunch of people I didn't know who didn't know me. So it's just a great opportunity to just learn more about what I could achieve at, from a young age. And that directly relates to my advice for future students is to just choose, well, really just reach for unattainable goals because the people within this program want you to succeed and they'll do anything that they can to help you like they did with mine. And alrighty, so this coming fall I will be attending the University of Lynchburg where I will be majoring in criminology and this project really helped me finalize that decision because at the beginning of the year I had no idea what I was going to major in and people would ask me and be like, I don't know. But now I can say that I'm going to be majoring in criminology because of this project. And thank you all for listening. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm not sure yet. I haven't really decided. But something within like law enforcement or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Miller said that he's going to continue it, my mentor, which is exciting. Yes, ma'am.
There's a lot of stuff in that pocket. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. <coughs> no. Do I have to do this still? I know. Hey, I'm doing fine. If I can do you, I think we got it. Hello, my name is Irwin Carter and I did my Blue Ridge Virtual Governor School capstone project on the impact of small businesses on communities. Uh, small businesses have a lot, have a very large impact on communities such as ours here in Madison. Uh, they do things like increasing the local tax, tax base, stimulating the economy, uh, providing jobs, providing a sense of community to people that shop there and that really interested me. So a little bit about me. Um, I like to skate. I participate in multiple sports like cross country, swim, and soccer. I'm a very active person. Uh, I really enjoy being outside and skateboarding is one of the reasons that brought me to my internship. So this is the downtown mall in Charlottesville, Virginia. It's one of my favorite places to go in Charlottesville. It's a great little place full of small businesses. Um, and very recently, a skate shop opened there called uh, Cinema Skate Shop. Uh, it was early last year that it opened. And uh, so I decided to check it out, and I, that's where I met my mentor. Uh, and And so small businesses interest me greatly. Uh, I really like seeing the way they impact communities. And when it opened, you could see uh, at the skate park, the, the cinema gear, like the shirts, the hats, everything um, popped up in an abundance. And you couldn't go anywhere without seeing uh, like a cinema sticker on something at the skate park. And so it really interests me that, uh, that one small business like this could provide such a sense of community and a hub for uh, skaters in Charlottesville or really for anything. So that's what led me to, this is me outside of cinema, and that's what led me to uh, my internship there. And during my internship at Cinema Skate Shop, I did things like uh, put together boards, uh, help customers with uh, choosing what pieces to put on their boards, uh, stocking shelves, uh, steaming clothes, you know, all the basic stuff, all while learning about uh, small businesses from the owner, Louie. And he told me about how they opened, how they advertise, and it really interested me. Uh, I really liked how he would uh, advertise like social media, and uh, I even helped him with some of the posts he made, and adding little uh, gift bags around the downtown mall for people to find, and then he would post about it on Instagram, and I really thought it was interesting the way he could connect with the community. So, and onto my community service. So my first attempt at community service was a donation drive where I collected uh, used safety equipment like helmets, uh, knee pads, elbow pads, that kind of thing. Um, because I was thinking and I thought a lot of people are scared of getting hurt while skateboarding or you know rollerblading or anything, riding a bike. So I figured the more people that I could get safety equip, <coughs> the more people I could get safety equipment to, um, the more people would be interested in that kind of thing, and I would really like to make that more accessible to people. So I decided to set up a donation drive. 
but unfortunately I did not get enough donations to continue on with that plan, uh, which is unfortunate because I really, I, I wanted that to work, but it didn't. So <laughs> my next plan was a skateboarding clinic where I would teach people the basics of uh, skating, just riding around, uh, pushing, uh, things like that. And uh, this was Walker. Uh, he was one of the kids that showed up. I was really happy with the turnout. Um, uh, I taught him just how to ride around. I tried to teach him a couple tricks, but because of the experience gap, he <laughs> couldn't quite get a handle on him. <laughs> but it was really fun teaching him how to ride around and stuff like that. Um, so some advice to uh, rising seniors or anybody in governor school right now is you need to um, start early on this project. Um, I would recommend doing your uh, internship over the summer so you have all that stuff worked out and just you just can't procrastinate with this because it really comes back to bite you if you do. Um, Um, so this project taught me a lot about, um, so during my time <laughs> at my internship, I, sorry, I just don't know how to word this. So this project impacted me a lot because before I, you know, I wasn't very good at um, public speaking, and I'm still not very good at it, obviously. Um, but I wasn't very good at it, and I think interning at the skate shop and helping customers and uh, providing my opinion, expressing my opinion, really helped me, um, you know, kind of gain a little bit of confidence. And the project really affected me in that way. And, you know, making calls, trying to set things up, uh, interacting with people I normally wouldn't interact with. Yeah, I think that really helped me. Uh, so my future plans, I know this is, an, is not related to small businesses at all, but I plan to attend a four-year university um, for a degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, I've been accepted to three universities, but I've not yet decided where I'm going. Thank you all for uh, listening to my presentation. Uh, is there any questions? Yeah. That definitely could have affected it. I also had flyers up at the skate shop, but uh, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I mean, uh, it might have just been a bad time. <laughs> Um, probably a front side flip. It's a front side 180 kick flip. <laughs> just the just the board. It turns like this and it flips like that. No, I don't. Mhm. Mm Oh gosh, um, 
I think maybe like a um, like a small coffee shop maybe would be a great addition in Madison on Main Street. Uh, yeah, something like that. Is that it? All right. Forward. I think you're going to be all hours before I leave. Okay. Okay, so like Ms. Johnson said, my name is Abigail Patterson, and the topic I chose to study was um, post-pandemic aviation. So a little bit about myself. Um, aviation has always been a fascination of mine since I was a child. Um, I remember going to air shows with my family when I was little, and my parents, like, either I would want to fly or that I'd want to work for NASA or some sort of topic under aviation and so when I was given the opportunity to do this internship and this whole project I thought that it would be um, a great chance for me to dig a little bit deeper into my interest in aviation. So my research topic was the effects of COVID-19 on aviation and the post-pandemic pilot shortage. So Obviously, it can be kind of inferred that any effect from COVID-19 would be negative on aviation. So here's a chart that you can see. The blue line is, so this is 2019, and then 2020 is in the middle, and then the year 2021 is on the right side of the graph. And the blue line shows the um, data of the amount of planes flown in the year. And then uh, you can see as soon as it gets to 2020, the chart goes down. And then the green line up here is like what was supposed to be predicted if COVID-19 never happened. So this chart, I thought it was a good summary of everything that I found from my research. Overall, COVID-19 um, caused airlines to be shut down. 
uh, plane flights weren't able to run, a lot of pilots and flight attendants were fired, and entire airports were kind of just closed due to people having to be quarantined. So that was kind of a summary of my research. So my internship was done at the Culpeper Regional Airport. Um, this is a photo that I took the morning of the second day I was at the airport, and you can see there's just a few airplanes there. Um, my mentor was Tanya Woodward, which is Samantha Woodward's mom. She's a wonderful lady, and she is the manager of the Culpeper Airport. Um, she, I emailed her, and I was like, is there any time that would be best for me to come shadow anyone at the airport? And then she was, she said that um, they were having, well, when I emailed her, it was mid-October, and she said that in the following weeks, they were going to be having the Culpeper Air Show. Um, it's just the annual air show that um, a couple of pilots come to, and then they just put on a show for the the community, and she said that that'd be a great opportunity for me to come over and observe, and so that's what I did. She helped me set up the whole thing. Um, she gave me some tasks to do while I was there, and so my internship was from October 8th to 9th, and I wanted to um, go back to the airport later on in like maybe November, but it just never ended up working out. So I was just there for the air show weekend. Um, so October 8th was on a Friday, and I took this photo right when I got there. So as you can see, there's an airplane flying around. This wasn't part of the air show. It was just some pilot having fun. Um, and then here in the back, you can see there's a tent. So Friday was for the airport sponsors. It was a show that the airport put on, and it was just kind of their way of saying thank you for supporting us. And so that tent is what that event was going to be held in that night. And here's some photos I took from that evening. As you can see here, there are some of the sponsors um, enjoying their meal that the airport provided. And then they also set up some hot air balloons. They didn't fly them. I was a little sad, but it's OK. And then the next day, Saturday, was the actual air show. They had, I don't know how many planes or what types of planes flew. They told me, but I forgot. <laughs> But anyway, this was one of them. I took all these photos. Um, as you can see, it just kind of finished doing like a loop and stuff. So they were doing really cool tricks. And despite the fact that this was still going on during the pandemic, the airport had a really great turnout. So many, so many people came to the air show. Um, I, don't, I don't have the exact number, but the entire parking lot was filled with people. And so I was happy that the community responded good. Here's another photo I took. And then my community service. I was, so I was kind of at a stump as to what to do for my community service. I didn't know if I should put together like an interactive thing for students at MCHS because I wanted it to still be significant and I wanted the students here to learn something from what I learned from my research and the internship really know how I was going to do that. So I came up with this idea of putting together a slideshow that I would either present in person to students at MCHS or I would make a recording of myself presenting it, which would be sent out to teachers and the teachers could show their students during homeroom. And I decided that that option would be better because more students would be able to see my presentation. Um, and it just kind of covered basic information on aviation and then like how you can get into that field if that's a career that you're interested in. So here's just some, I put in a few slides that were from my slideshow. You can just see that I had some descriptions of different types of aviation. Um, uh, the difference between the aviation and airline industry. And then after the teachers had shown all of their students uh, my video, I had each student take a survey and it just kind of consisted of questions like how much information did you know about aviation before watching the presentation video and you can see that the majority of the people there was 92 responses the majority of the people said they didn't know anything which was a one and then nine people said they knew a lot which is um, a five and then 
after the watching after watching the video how much more are you informed about aviation you can see that a lot more people are informed after watching it which is was kind of the point <laughs> um my future plans so at the moment I plan on going to PVCC and just kind of taking general classes and then I would like to transfer to UVA to get my aerospace engineering degree and then after that I am planning on becoming a pilot I'm not sure if that's going to be like a private pilot or for an airline or what I just know that I want to fly um, some advice that I would give to students um, up and coming governor school students would be to pick a topic that you're genuinely interested in um, when I started this whole project I I kind of like I was dappling in a few different topics um, one of which consisted of trying to do an internship at a running shop but all of it kind of fell through and I even tried doing this particular internship at the Orange Airport and it just wasn't working out and then I was sitting in class one day and I was complaining to <laughs> my classmates about how I couldn't find an internship anywhere and that I was wasting time and then Samantha here stood up and she was like my mom's the manager of the Culpeper Airport <laughs> I was like how did I not know this the whole time so my point is that like if you persist on a topic that you're genuinely interested you're going to find someone who is willing to take you and willing to work with you so I'm just glad that I was given this opportunity and before the <laughs> before the presentation not the presentation the project like I said I knew that aviation was an interest of mine and I didn't know where I wanted to work I knew that I wanted my career to somehow kind of involve planes or travel or something like that but I'm thankful that after this whole internship I'm certain that I want to become a pilot. Um, I'm excited for what the future has in store for me. And yeah, thank you for taking the time to watch my presentation. Are there any questions? Uh, it was all the students at Madison. Mm -hmm. So I sent out. I made a screen recording of me presenting the presentation and then I sent that to Miss Winham and then she sent that to all the teachers and then they showed the video to their students during homeroom so yeah all the students were able to see my video yeah thank you <laughs> yeah this one's my favorite yeah all of them were at the air show like even worse than what it was beforehand um, the reason I incorporated that into my t into my research is because since I was kind of involving it with COVID obviously the pandemic is still going on and still data is being processed and so I wanted to kind of incorporate something that has a little bit more research behind it and so I decided to also talk about the pilot shortage and that has been going on for years but COVID has kind of just worsened the whole situation. Yeah. Is that it? Okay. <laughs>
Yes. <laughs> oh. That one works, though. <laughs> okay, either one's fine. For my senior internship, I chose to do pediatric health. So in 2020, I started the long, tedious process to become a certified nursing assistant, and obviously COVID really put a hold on that. There were lots of delays and cancellations, what felt like a billion tears, and lots of angry phone calls. But I was finally able to do clinical, and while there, I realized that a nursing home setting just wasn't what I wanted to do. So once I became a CNA, I decided to do home health care. And I ended up with the sweetest 10-year-old girl who had Rett syndrome, so she was nonverbal. She needed help with everyday tasks, which is why I chose to do my internship at Wellspring and Culpepper. It was one of the few places that actually allowed you to come in and be around pediatric patients. I was there for five days from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and they were some of the longest days. And I thought that a doctor's office may be the path that I wanted to pursue. My advisor can be seen in the middle of Leah and I. She is a pediatric nurse at Wellspring, and she was so helpful and so willing to teach. And she made being there just a really positive experience. So while I was there, I did patient intake. So I would go out to the lobby, get the patient, bring them back, get their weight, followed by their height, which is when I learned that trying to get a six-year-old to stand still and straight is just not possible. And then for the older children, when they had to do a vision test, they would do the visual, where you stand 20 feet away, you cover one eye, you read what you see. And then I learned how important it was to always have sticky notes because numbers are not my thing and they easily get mixed up and I could never remember them. So I only went one day without sticky notes and a pen. Once I had all the numbers I needed, they would come back to this room, which just happened to be a Winnie the Pooh themed room. Once in there, I would get their vital signs such as blood pressure, temperature, and oxygen. And then that would be displayed on this screen. This is where the nurse would get all the information that she needed for the chart that the doctor would then look at. So for the younger kids who don't really know their letters or don't quite grasp the concept of covering one eye, we would use this to test their vision. It's basically just a camera. You would turn the light off and it actually made noise. So the child would look at it and then it would take a picture of their eyes and tell us what their vision was. I got to do one EKG when I was there, which was super fun. Um, you basically just take stickers, you put them on the patient's chest, their arms, and their legs, and then you attach leads to it, and it makes sure that their heart is beating like it should, and there are no abnormalities. So a lot of patients come in because they need vaccines, and you would go in this room and find what was needed to administer it. The machine in the middle would actually make you input what you needed as well as other information before it would actually let you take it. So when I wasn't with patients, I was entering their shot records into the computer. Um, this is an example of it because for HIPAA reasons, I could not take pictures of the actual ones that I did. It's a long and tedious process, especially when you get two to three doses of about 10 different vaccines before you turn 18. Um, but it's also really important that these are uploaded so that you don't get vaccinated more than you have to or you're not missing something. Um, babies tend to get all of their vaccines in their thigh because it reduces the chance of a reaction. COVID made this whole project really difficult. Um, at Wellspring, we were only seeing well patients, so we had a lot of students who were there for physicals and medication checkups, a couple concussion follow-ups but all patients who had a cough, fever, runny nose, really anything that could have been a symptom of COVID were seen outside. And being an intern, I wasn't really around those. 
So my main question throughout this whole project was what affects pediatric health? And through a lot of research, <laughs> when it comes to pediatric health, um, it is actually like the growth development to make sure that their brain is working like it should on top of just being healthy in general. The main thing that affects pediatric health is strep throat cases, followed closely by ear infections. And there are many different types of ear infections, but the most common would be a middle ear infection, followed by swimmer's ear, which is an infection of the skin in the ear canal caused by water. Some of the other things that really affect pediatric health are UTIs, bronchitis, allergic reactions, fever, and common colds. The best way for a child to prevent being sick is to make sure that they're up to date on their vaccines and they wash their hands frequently. So for community service, we knew that we wanted to do healthcare packages, but as high school students, we were broke. So we created a GoFundMe page where we were able to raise $250 to put together our healthcare packages. Inside, you could find toothbrushes, toothpaste, hand sanitizer, a couple different snacks, a mask, and the patients really seemed to love it, and it was a great way to give back. My future plans include going to college to get my RN, followed by BSN. I have no idea what college yet, but I have so many options. And the advice I would give to a future governor school senior would be, if you have a chance, take it. The only thing you're going to regret are the chances that you don't take. In conclusion, I wouldn't want to work at a doctor's office. It's not the thing for me. I would definitely want to do a hospital setting, and if I could do this project all over again, I would really try to get a hospital internship. But overall, it was an amazing opportunity to have. We would hand them out at Wellspring with like a little flyer about like when they were open and things like that.